direction on that. And so um, we've talked about those terms last week. We're down to the last bullet point there on page four. It says, even though the day of the Lord is pictured as a time of judgment and destruction and death, is also described in terms of promise and hope. And you go back to the Old Testament particularly, and um, the things that are prophesied regarding, regarding the nation of Israel and, and how during the millennial kingdom Israel is going to be exalted. You know, the Lord will be here himself present on the earth, ruling and reigning as the king, and, and uh, you know, the curse will be lifted, and you know, this world will be uh, a grand place to be and to experience. And it says, um, during that time, period of time, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh, and what happened on the day of Pentecost? You know, Peter quoted this, and, and he was just making a point that is, you know, what Joel said, and we'll look at this when we get to chapter 2, uh, uh, regarding the work of the Spirit at that time and what God will do. You know, what we saw there on the day of Pentecost was, was typical of that. And, and Peter was telling those who questioned what was going on that, you know, these folks weren't drunk out of their head and acting like a bunch of fools. They were, you know, what was actually taking place was a movement of God's Spirit on them. And so he applied in Joel to what happened on the day of Pentecost regarding the birth of the church. It says, During the millennial kingdom, the earth will be filled with peace and prosperity. And the, the one big thing or good thing that will happen that time, Satan is going to be bound for those thousand years. And, you know, um, he just stirs up and agitates the sin that's in people's hearts. You know, uh, and you know, he's going to be bound and during that time, so he won't be able to have exercise his activity that he'd like to have here on earth during that time. And the thing bad that'll happen is when he is released, and there'll be so many people, in spite of what they have seen regarding God's blessings during that time and the glory of God during that time, uh, there will be so many that will rebel and follow after him that one last time, unfortunately. And so the day of the Lord is described in, in, in good terms and, and terms that to something to be able to be looked forward to. It's also described as thing a time of, uh, you know, it'll be terrible and, and filled with judgment and, and destruction and heartache. <clears throat> And to finish up here, it says the outcome of the future day of the Lord will be anything but desirable for those who oppose God and have rebelled against Him. It will be the time when God will, in a very vivid manner, vindicate His righteousness and holiness before the world. And that includes Israel as well. You know, if, if we won't stand for God, God will stand for Himself. And uh, so uh, it's going to be during that time God will demonstrate his holiness and the judgments that he sends and carries out. It says the Lord will make himself known before the people of the world and will be exalted in their sight. And the, the prophet Ezekiel has a lot to say about that. You know, Ezekiel many, many, many times, and I quit counting after about 30 or 40, you know, it says they shall know the Lord or know Yahweh as a result of the things that he does. And so it's a very commonly used phrase in, in that prophecy. And a lot of those things are, are uh, judgmental things and, and harsh things. And uh, it's through that God will demonstrate, you know, his hatred for sin and his holiness and his righteousness. It says the arrogant and proud will be filled with t fear and uncertainty. You know, Isaiah speaks to that. And um, so for many, death will be the result. For others that survive, all they have, might have possessed will be destroyed and taken from them. If you imagine, you know, being able to live all the way through the tribulation period, you know, and you come out on the end of that, you're still an unbeliever. But all you've witnessed and seen is, is nothing but destruction and death. And, and uh, you know, this world is in ruins. And, and uh, you know, the only thing left, though, is to face the Lord during that judgment. It says the end result of the final <clears throat> day of the Lord will be the second death and separation from God forever in the lake of fire. So for those who oppose God and, and actually survive the tribulation, there will be nothing any better to look forward to. You know, it would be an eternity separated from God. And, you know, they stand before the Lord at that great white throne judgment. And, you know, says the books will be opened. And, and, you know, the things that they've done, you know, to show that they don't know the Lord will be uh, brought before them. 
and that they were deserving of what God's sentence will be. So the final day of the Lord comprises the final acts of God by which he will remove everything contrary to him from his presence forever. <clears throat> you know, that's going to be, as we talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> you know, God's at work now, and he's working that plan, and, you know, he's going to restore this creation to himself. And that day of the Lord is, is the culmination of that. And uh, then last, for the righteous, great blessings await them. And the Bible says, and ultimately at the culmination of the day of the Lord, God's people will spend eternity with the Lord in whose presence everything sinful, hurtful, corruptful, unloving, so forth and so on, cannot and will not reside forever. And if you know the Lord as your Savior now, you know, that's something we can rejoice about and take uh, comfort in, in spite of how bad it may get here and, and how bleak the outcome may be. Uh, we know what the future holds for God's people. And so um, that's where we can end looking at the day of the Lord. You know, it's certainly not all that could be said about it, you know, but it's, I think, some description about the day of the Lord. And as we work through the little book of Joel, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. All right, we're going to look at <coughs> chapter 1 here in Lesson 2. <coughs> and uh, get some things to consider from this. And you know, for the sake of time, we'll just read the verses kind of as we go along in this. So in verse 1 says, The word of the Lord, or the word of Yahweh, or Jehovah, that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. And uh, so Joel began his prophecy, first by establishing the fact that the message he was going to deliver was from the Lord. And it was the name used there. We see the, where it says all caps, the Lord is where the word Jehovah or Yahweh is in, in the Hebrew. And as we'll see, that's a special name for him that uh, had a lot of meaning to the, to the Israelites. And so that's often why that particular, I think, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, why that particular name is used. So this manner of introducing a prophecy was very common. In fact, you, you know, you look at a lot of the other minor prophets and their introductions, and you see this phrase or something very similar to that phrase. And you know, it's establishing this is not my what I'm going to say is not just for me. This is this is from God Himself, and it's the God that has a special relationship with Israel, and He's having something to say to you. It says, if anyone happened to doubt the claim made by Joel, the presence of the locust plague would validate that he had proclaimed the word of God. And so, uh, one like he was just out there talking and speaking about something, he was talking about something in, in reality that was uh, very present and certainly would get the attention of, of those who would listen to him or read this prophecy. He then introduces himself. <clears throat> he refers to himself as the son of Pethuel, which was a common way of identifying someone in Bible times, since people generally did not have surnames at that time. And so, in order to describe who you were, I would say, I'm Joel, I'm the son of Richard, you might say, back in, in the ancient times. And, and, you know, there wouldn't be a, a shank then. <laughs> and uh, it would just be... Uh, my name Joel and uh, so that's that's a very common thing as well for that time this was likely done to distinguish himself from the other Joels since the name was fairly common in ancient Israel and we talked about that last time by introducing himself in such a manner it is possible that Joel or his father or both of them were personally known by some of the people to who would read his prophecy and so you know, maybe for some people there's a recognition of, of the individual and uh, who they were and what family they was in and so forth and so on. <clears throat> so Joel declares that he was conveying the word of the Lord rather than the word of God, <clears throat> even though those are the same things. He makes it a very distinct um, use of the word Lord or Yahweh. This is notable for two reasons. <clears throat> Um, first, it is God's name that has a relationship to his covenant with the Israelites. In the Old Testament, Yahweh is often the name for God that is used in context of covenant. And I've given several several 
uh, scriptures regarding that and, and where it speaks of a covenant and it's always Yahweh or used in those situations. <clears throat> Even in the new covenant in Jeremiah, that's the name of God that is used in those situations. And um, in fact, we may just read one <clears throat> so we get a gist of that. In Deuteronomy <clears throat> 26 and 17, I mean 17 and 18, it says, Thou hast avouched the Lord this day to be thy God, and to walk in his ways. And the words of God you know, came to them through Moses and, and gave them the covenant. The people says, you know, we're going to do it. We're going to obey. You know, we're going to do what you tell us to do. And you know, they swore they would do that. And so this is you know, the Lord's response. It says, Thou hast avouched the Lord, or Jehovah this day, to be thy God, and to walk in his ways, and to keep his statutes, and his commandments, and his judgments, and to hearken unto his voice. And it says, And the Lord, or Yahweh, hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee that thou shouldest keep all his commandments. And to make thee high above all nations which he hath made, in praise, and in name, and in honor, that thou mayest be a holy people unto the Lord thy God as he has spoken. And so, you know, it's always used a lot in the context of, of covenant. And therefore, it speaks of relationship, and that's why it's so important and what's so important to the Israelites. It is used in relation to having an intimate, close relationship, such as is to be depicted in marriage between a husband and wife. This is why the religious leadership reacted so strongly to Jesus declaration that before Abraham was, I am. You know, I am being Yahweh. And and that's what really you know set them off and why they sought to kill him at that time. It's why the crowd that came to arrest Jesus reacted in the manner they did when he answered, I am he. And the word he there is, you know, used in translation. You know, he might have said, you know, I am at that point. And, uh, you know, you read that account. And uh, it might have been, uh, I often I thought about this, is there might have been some in that group that hadn't heard him say that before. You know, those that came there to, to arrest him. And... Um, it says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? You know, the crowd that was coming to arrest him. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. And, you know, for those who understood what that name meant, you know, hmm, this guy says he's God. And, and, and you know, you know here, we're here confronted by, you know, the Lord. And so, uh, you know, it, I think it really shook them there for a little bit. And, and to kind of uh, get their senses back about what was going on. And so... Um, that's because the name uh, Yahweh meant uh, something so much to them. They understood the significance of the name I Am, since it's the name that Yahweh used regarding himself and his relationship to Israel. You know, when he came to Moses, you know, he says, I Am, you know, sent you. And um, second, the name Yahweh is used in reference to God's active work for his people Israel. It says, even though God had revealed himself by the name earlier in history, it is his characteristic as Redeemer that was revealed in his relationship to the Israelites when he delivered them from the Egyptians. You, know, you go way back to Genesis 4, there you see the first reference to the use of that name. But, um, and I should have, uh, I think this is one in Genesis where it makes a point about it. And... Uh, it says, when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord, or Yahweh, appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And um, but it also says in Genesis that even though God had made that name known to them, he, or, or revealed himself in by that name, the full characteristics of what that name meant was not revealed to, to 
to Abraham and, and to some of the early uh, people that lived here on the earth. In other words, they knew the name, but they didn't know all that was entailed and what was meant by that name till he um, started his relationship with the Israelites. <clears throat> It is his characteristic as redeemer that was made known. And you know, the Lord talks about redeeming them from, from Egypt and, and bring, delivering them from Egypt. In addition to Yahweh acting as redeemer, the aim Yahweh implies that God actively manifests himself in judgment and retribution. And we see a whole lot of references in, in the Bible to that, and in particular in the book of Ezekiel, as I said earlier, those chapters there, if you look through there, you see again and again, and they shall know that I am the Lord, or I am Yahweh, through the, all the things that God says he will do. And um, it says, therefore, when Job, Joel began his prophecy in the name of Yahweh, the powerful, involved, covenant-keeping, redeeming characteristics of God were brought to bear on the minds and hearts of the people who would hear and read the prophecy. In other words, this is like us today, you know, you mentioned the name Bobby Andrews. Probably some things come to mind, don't they? <laughs> you know, if you had any you know, interaction with them at all. You know, the same way other people you have interaction with. You mention their name and, and there's things that come to your mind, some thoughts that come to your mind about you know, that individual. And, and so for the Israelites, when you mention the name Yahweh, you know, immediately, if they were any kind of a uh, Israelite at all, there was things about that name that had meaning in their lives and, and uh, had a bearing upon their life. And so it was because of their particular relationship with him. And I thought about this, because Yahweh is revealed in the New Testament in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name Jesus Christ should have a similar impact on the people who hear his name. Who do we think about when the name of Jesus Christ is said? What does Christ mean to us? And, and who is he to us? You know, and, and we think about that name being the name above every name and, and to be given all honor and worship as the person that, that that name represents. And if you ever noticed, a lot of this world around us, you know, you, you can talk about God, you can talk about uh, spiritual things and so forth and so on, but when you mention the name of Jesus Christ, boy, the hair on the neck really gets ruffled up. And it's because of what that name means and who that name stands for and what it implies. And, and, um, and you know, there's a recognition even in the unbelieving world about the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, so there we see, you know, some very similarities. And, and the name Christ, Jesus Christ, should be just as special to us and are more meaningful to us as our Redeemer and, and our Lord as the word Yahweh, the name Yahweh was to the Israelites. And uh, so we can make a, make a parallel there regarding that. It says, Joel then called upon the people to pay attention to what he was going to say about the devastating plague that was afflicting the Israelites. There in verse 2, says, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? <clears throat> tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. You asked the older men if they had ever experienced a plague that was as severe as what was taking place. The elder Israelites were generally very knowledgeable regarding the nation's history. You know, they carried on things by word of mouth. You know, tradition was hand down, and, and great events of the past was hand down from generation to generation by word of mouth. And it was a very important thing to, to carry that heritage of that nation forward. And so that's why the question to the, to the elder men. They would know if the nation had ever endured such dire circumstance before. You know, they would have, you know, understood what, what Joel was asking. And, um, you know, has there anything in the history of the nation been like this before, uh, to this degree? They had probably endured plagues before, but probably hadn't been anything like this one. In obedience to God's commands given through Moses, Joel admonished the Israelites to give instruction to their children about the plague there in verse 3. You know, it was, this was a significant thing. It was something that to be brought to bear upon the, the minds of, of everybody. This was to be done so that future generations would remember the many acts of loving kindness that God had extended to the nation. And so that the people would be reminded also that God would judge their disobedience. 
you know, back in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, you know, you have God's promises of blessing. You know, if the nation would obey and honor Him, you also had the promise of His cursing and, and judgment if they chose to disobey. And so all this was, you know, in light of this plague was to be brought to bear upon the, the minds and, and the hearts of the individuals that were uh, listening to Joel. The intention of such acts was to encourage obedience so that the blessings of God could be experienced. And, you know, uh, that was part of what parents were to instruct the children about. You know, it's a lot better to, to obey the Lord and to honor Him than it would be to, to go against Him. And this is the result of that, as uh, they would see. Now, verse 4 describes the locusts that had eaten all the vegetation within the nation. <coughs> It says, That which the pommel worm, hath, pommel worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath eaten hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. You know, the plague apparently came in four stages, with each succeeding stage increasing the damage. Many scholars believe that four types of locusts are being referred to during the Hebrew language used. Others believe that it was four characteristics of the locusts. I'm kind of in favor of the characteristics. When you look at what these meaning behind these terms, they're all descriptive terms. They're not something used to, to describe, like we talk about a bee and an ant and a fly and a gnat and, you know, in a noun way. These are terms that are descriptive of, of a type of insect and what it does or what's characteristic of it. And, um, you know, the pommel worm, uh, pommel worm, the Hebrew term is something that means devouring. You know, it's you know it's a, a something that just you know eating and 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 uh, taking in whatever's in front of it. The word locus, <coughs> arba, it comes from a base word meaning rapid increase, and you know it don't take long for the insect population to increase. And from what I've heard, you know, with particularly these locust plagues, you know, I mean, it's just, it's like an explosion. Um, the way that uh, the increase comes sometimes with these things. <clears throat> it's also kind of the word used for grasshopper, which I guess is a type of a first cousin or second cousin to a locust. And uh, so the canker worm and is a word, yalek, it means one that licks up. And, you know, you get a picture like our dog, Alice. When you give her her food, she gets through eating it all up and then she licks the pot sometimes. <laughs> you know, she wants to get every little crumb. <laughs> and so it's descriptive of these uh, insects. And caterpillar, causal, one that consumes. You know, just talk about a total uh, consumption of, of all that's, that's present. So Joel is using very descriptive terms to describe what's going on here. In fact, down through this whole thing, in talking about this plague, he uses a lot of very descriptive language to get them to understand the, and get us to understand the severity of what was taking place. <clears throat> the most important point that Joel was trying to describe was the overwhelming devastation that the insects had created regarding all forms of plant life in Judah. The locusts had eaten all the grapes and any other fruit that would have been used to make wine. You get to verse 5. It says, Awake you drunkards, and weep, and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Uh, so, you know, the things that, that the people uh, used to grow crops and, and to make the, the food they had, you know, all of it was, was being eaten by these locusts. The drunkards would have nothing to satisfy their craving for alcohol. And so um, there'll be a lot of sadness, I guess, and, and heartbreak on their part. In verse 6, Joel compares the locusts to a large invading army from another nation. It says, For a nation has come up on my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. He hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. You know, uh, a lion will have the teeth, you know, to bite and to cut through, and it has the teeth to, to chew up what's, what's taken into the mouth. And, you know, um, apparently the locusts is the same way. You know, they'll strip the vegetation off, and then they have the ability to, to I guess, grind it up or, or process it you know, for digestion. It's interesting here that... Um, terminology also that's used here for Joel. He considers Judah as my land, which was from under attack from without. You see, for a nation has come up on my land, strong and, and without number. And um, it says the prophet was suffering just like the rest of the people. You know, he wasn't, you know, uh, 
outside of what was going on. He, he was a part of it. He was in the midst of it himself. He mentions that my vine was laid waste and um, there verse 7 and um, it means, the word there means shemal means devastated to the point that it results in astonishment. Can you imagine you go back, try to put yourself in the position of, of that ancient Israelite. And, you know, you, you're an agrarian society. You know, basically you live because of the crops that you grow and the livestock that you have, which depends upon the crops that you grow. And if, if you watch this cloud of, of insects, locusts come in, you know, maybe you have your crops out there and things are looking good and, and from what's going on you're you know, hopeful and you're expecting a good harvest and, and you're kind of rejoicing in that. And then you watch these locusts move in and, and right before your eyes you see them just take it right down to the ground. Nothing you can do about it. And, and when everything is done, you know, it's almost like you cannot believe the total devastation of what's taken place. And, and not only is your crops gone and the grass gone from the fields and the leaves off the shrubs and the, the trees and everything that grew on the trees is gone. He even talks in here about the bark being stripped from the fig trees. And, you know, the insects are so ravenous and hungry when the leaves and things are gone, they start actually eating the twigs and, and the bark off the, off the trees. And when they move on, all you see, that's what you see left. There's nothing but the earth and... and, and you know, the stripped trees and whatever's left standing. And it's like you cannot hardly believe, you know, the, the degree of destruction, what goes on, had gone on. And that's the idea behind this term, um, laid waste. You know, there's nothing. There's nothing left. And um, it's horrific. It says, And my fig tree was clean, bare, and cast away, you know, with the limbs being stripped of bark. The use of the word my could have been used by Joel in speaking for the Lord in reference to what had taken place in God's own land. You know, uh, Joel could also, besides referring to himself and what was his, he could also have been uh, presenting himself in, in the place of God. And God allowed this, you know, to his own, to his own land for his own purposes. And, and, uh, but it was the very opposite of what God is and does. You know, God is the one that gives life and, 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 and brings forth that. And, and so we see this great, great destruction from this plague. You know, the morning was not to be limited to the drunkards. And in the next verses, 8 through 14, you'll know, talk about this all in various descriptive ways. The entire nation was to lament because of the total devastation of all plant life. You know, the people were to mourn like a young virgin woman whose husband had suddenly died just before the marriage ceremony. Instead of being filled with happiness and looking forward to sharing life with her husband, she would be filled with sorrow and a great sense of loss. You know, you know, that's why you hear something tragic like that happening. You know, a young couple and they're getting ready to, you know, to get married and all of a sudden something happens to one of them. You know, maybe a day or two before that event was to take place. Or the, I guess it was a couple here last week that was in Barcelona. I was they celebrating their anniversary or their honeymoon or something. And I think one of them got killed. And can you imagine what it felt like to that person left behind? You know, something so unexpected and, and so devastating in life. And, and you know, the, the grief and all that would be felt at that moment, that's what was to be uh, felt by these people here, the Israelites in this situation. <laughs> You know, perhaps until the, the time the plague struck, the Israelites were looking forward to an abundant harvest with a, from a variety of crops and fruit-bearing vines and trees. Now many people are probably anxiously wondering where they would find enough to feed their families or sustain the livestock. Despair likely filled the hearts of many. You know, so they went from one day, everything looking good, and, and, and you know, everything's just going great. And then here a day or two later, it's just completely, totally the opposite. And, uh, you know, life went from up here down to the, the very bottom, you might say, just so quickly. Things change, can change so quickly. <clears throat> you know, the priests were to mourn as well. There'd be nothing left to sacrifice to the Lord. You know, it says the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. <clears throat> and... Uh, so it's not just the common person or the average person or whatever, the, you know, the religious leadership you know, were to be involved in this as well. And um, the priests also depended on obtaining their food from a portion of the sacrifices they brought to the temple. You know, so their resources you know, to sustain life were gone. 
and uh, we'll look a little bit more at this uh, thing about the sacrifices as well in a minute, but you know, just looking from the perspective of the priest and what it meant to them. <coughs> Then Joel goes on to give a vivid description of the complete ruin that the nation was experiencing. There in verse 10, it says, The field is wasted, the land mourneth. The, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, and the oil languishes. You know, the thing is, or idea is, he's trying to say is, you know, there's this complete, complete devastation and destruction here. The fields and the crops of grain were wasted. Shadad means to be utterly ruined or destroyed by something that has absolute power. And, um, you know, this plague of locusts, there's no way in the world, you know, those people could stop it or slow it or prevent it from taking place. They could, all they could do is, is stand and watch, more or less. There were no olives left on the olive trees to press to make oil, an important commodity for the people at that time. Joel declared the land mourneth. A different word, obel, means to express deep sorrow by great wailing or lamenting. There was no juice, grape juice, to drink. So everything, everything is gone. Everything is gone. You know, the farmers to be ashamed, there in verse 11, but be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. And the word shame there means to turn pale. Words is to witness something that you know it almost like sucks the life out of you. You know you just can't hardly believe it. You know for the for the horror of it and, and how terrible it is. The scene before their eyes must have been horrific. Those that tended the vineyards were to howl, and that means to wail loudly and to, and with much emotion. You know, it was an expression of despair and grief and sorrow, and and. Uh, not only was the source of food for the year gone, so was the source of income with which to purchase other things needed to sustain life. The locusts that eat all the wheat and barley, you know, they were the staple foods for the Israelites. And so, um, terrible time. It says, the vine is dressed dried up, the fig tree languishes, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even the trees of the field are without because joy is withered away from the sons of men. You know, the fruit trees are destroyed. You know, uh, you know, we like fruit. I like fruit because it's, you know, a lot of it's sweet, tastes good, and, and all that kind of thing. And I'm sure it was for them. You know, they talk about the figs and, and how enjoyable they were. And um, even the other trees had dried up. In addition to being stripped of their foliage by the locusts, the trees were impacted by the drought that was present. Just as plant life had withered because of the locusts and drought, so had the joy withered in the hearts of the people. You know, just like it took all the life out of them. You know, it's, you know, just sapped everything out of them. Instead of looking forward with anticipation and enjoying the harvest, the various crops, despair and anguish, fill their hearts. There in verse 13, we see Joel call on the priest to take the leadership in leading the nation in a time of fasting and repentance due to the judgment that comes from God in the form of locusts and drought. And that's really a principle that should be applied today. You know, when hard times come, you know, those that are positions of leadership should show that leadership and exercise that leadership, you know, to help the people through. And um, they were to express genuine sorrow, not only for the effects of the ju judgment, you know, that's bad enough um, when you think about it, and all that was going on on the physical level, but even more so for the reason God had sent the judgment. There was something really to, to be concerned about as well and to be sorry about. It's not just that you're going through this plague. It was what led to the plague. Why had God sent the plague? It's because of the spiritual condition that was present in the people. And that's something that ought to be grievous as well and, and ought, to, ought to be heartbreaking as well. To be clothed in sackcloth is a sign of grieving. The offering of sacrifices to God at the temple was very important to the well-being of the nation. There it says, Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering was beholden from the house of your God. Sanctify you a fast and call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and, elders and all the inhabitants of the land unto the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. You know, in spite of the plague, the Lord was still their God. You know, that hadn't changed. And, and in fact, it was, he was their God and it's what the reason this was going on, you might say. 
is for that very reason. And, uh, but the, the sacrifices was very important to the well-being of the nation. It was, it was critical. It was through this systematic offering to God that the good of the people was preserved, the nation protected, and God glorified. You know, it, was, it was bad on two levels for the priests. You know, number one, they didn't have what they needed to live. And number two, because of what it meant, spiritually speaking, in their relationship to God as a nation. And in, um, perhaps the Lord allowed circumstances to prevent the sacrifices from being offered because the priests and the people were not making their offers to God with the right attitude in their heart to begin with. <clears throat> you know, they were going through the motions, you might say. It really wasn't any heartfelt expression of love and thanksgiving to God in what they were doing. They were just carrying on business as usual. And so God wasn't pleased with it. And so the real way to get their attention to show he wasn't pleased with it is to eliminate it. And, and, and to have them to understand, you know, you need to get right with me and, and, and get on right terms with me, then uh, I'll receive your sacrifices, I'll receive your offerings. And um, See, it was God's way of getting the attention of the Israelites and getting them to understand they were not right in standing with Him. <clears throat> it's like us today here. I mean, you might throw in a wad of money into that offering plate, that would, you know, the usher couldn't carry it out the back door. But if it wasn't given with the right attitude in your heart, it doesn't mean anything to God. You know, it's not, not something that He would accept. And so uh, that's what the, I think God was doing here with the, in this thing with the Israelites about this. The priests were to call for a time of fasting and crying unto the Lord with a repentant attitude and seeking His mercy. Everyone was to participate and assemble themselves at the temple. You know, the whole nation was guilty. They were guilty collectively as a whole. And therefore, everybody was called you know, to this solemn assembly. None was exempt. And, and so the nation as a whole was to, to be repentant and to be humble themselves before God. In verse 15, we see the introduction of the, of the phrase, Day of the Lord. It says, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord, or the day of Yahweh, is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty, it shall come. <clears throat> now, Joel was not stating that the locust plague was the day of the Lord. You know, you notice he said, is at hand. In other words, it hadn't come, but it's near. You know, it's around the corner. And... Uh, It says that the day of the Lord would come with the same devastation and suddenness as that plague had. In other words, it was, it was a, you might say, typical of it. It was pointing to it. Um, you know, what was taking place would, is a kind of a picture of, of what would happen. And uh, the fact that the day of the Lord was at hand meant it had not arrived yet. The phrase does mean that it could happen at any time. And characteristic of that day, and we talked about this just a little bit ago, is destruction. The word showed, I mean to make desolate or to make waste of something or to ruin something. And it would be that destruction from the Almighty. And here's a term that sometimes we hear, Shaddai, actually it's uh, Shaddai. And, and um, you know, I thought there was a song I think had that name in it, El Shaddai, God Almighty. And, and, um, you know, it was a name that the Israelites knew and understood. And it's from a base word meaning to be powerful, all-powerful, all which God is. So that it's from the Almighty One that this destruction has come. You know, you can't blame the devil. You know, this one, this one's from the Lord and for His purposes and for His reasons. God can use His infinite power to protect and bless in times of trouble. You know, Psalm 91 tells us being under the shadow of the Almighty and being in His protection, being in His care. And that's something that, that we should rejoice in and, and take advantage of in troublesome times. And, uh, but He also uses that power to execute His judgment without being hindered as well. And you know, God, when He determines to do something and He starts it in motion, there's nothing that can, can stop it and prevent it from happening. And so God uses His power and His ability. He can use it to be viewed as a blessing, and it is a blessing, and, and for the care of His people and, and for the help of His people. And also that same power can be used in times of judgment and execution of His will um, in situations where those who rebel against Him. And so that's what we see behind the name of that particular name of God. 
and we're out of time, so that's where we'll pick up 